viewers, you join me at an undisclosed location somewhere in London where I am absolutely thrilled to be with Daniel Cockatilo. Have I pronounced that correctly? Yeah. Ish. I, well, if you're northern, <laughs> we, we say Cockatilo. Cockatilo. Yeah. There we go. Let, let that be the... Let, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be a it's lesson not... to all of you. Yeah, everybody gets the name wrong. But okay. Um, yeah. Daniel Crocker Taylor. And there's someone at the door. And there's someone at the door. I wonder if it's a JD. <laughs> Daniel is the director of an incredible film that I only saw last night for the first time called Apostasy. If you haven't seen it yet, see it. Um, and I have a lot of questions I have prepared for you. <laughs> Great. Okay. So I Bring think, on. first of all, let's just get out of the way that we've, we've just been talking off camera and we've realised that we kind of know each other or our paths have crossed in the past. Yeah. Because we both come from Manchester or within yeah. a, a circumference of Manchester. And, we know um, a lot of the same people. We yeah. know a lot of the same. We figured out we went to at least one, uh, one wedding. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the real joys for me, was to see a film not just about JWs, but a film that was shot in places that I can remember. Yeah. So... Well, you mentioned yesterday that even the Kingdom Hall in the film, yeah. you were involved in the construction work. I, I helped lay the paving slabs at the front of that very Kingdom Hall. I worked inside, and then afterwards they were doing the landscaping, and I got roped into helping out with the landscaping. <laughs> so it was so strange to see a Kingdom Hall, oh, hang on, um, and we'll get to that, Yeah. Okay. but um, can you, and you don't have to kind of spill everything, but what, if you could give us a feel for your background with JWs? Yeah, sure. Well, my mum came into the, into the organisation when I was young, about seven or eight years old, and then I got roped into going. Uh, and that's where I stayed, yeah, till I was, I went to college, I went to uni. It was only after uni that I, I moved away from my family and uh, felt comfortable, you know, not going to the Kingdom Hall. Um, right. What, was that kind of controversial going to university? Yeah, I mean, it was, I was the first in the family to go. Yeah. So there was, there was, it was a combination of, of pride, but then also uh, uncertainty and um, uh, people were wondering whether or not it was a waste of time, you know, because back then people, you know, the 1914 prophecy was still going. Mm. So um, there was that kind of, uh, you know, if you're going to, what's the point of going to college? How, how are you going to feel, you know, if Jesus returns and you're in college and not in the, one of the meetings? I used to get that crap off the elders. So, um, which you worked into the film, yeah, which is in the film. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That got one of the loudest laughs, right? Oh, right, okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's yeah, I heard there was a lot of laughs in the screen last night. Um, that's interesting, mm. there's a lot of ex witnesses in the audience. I don't um, think it turned... was just them laughing, though, it right, couldn't okay. have just been them laughing, right? It's I'm not gonna... spread to everybody, no, yeah. I think. I think I'm going, to, I'm going to. In fact, I'll ask you about it now. You, there's, it's a a gut wrenching film, but there's there are moments where not just the XJWs in the audience, because they I reckon they made up maybe ten percent of the audience last night, mm -hmm. but the majority of the audience erupts in laughter. Mm. Are those? moments are you when you're writing the script you're thinking this will make people laugh or were you surprised during screenings to see people laughing at moments that you didn't expect them to laugh um it's a funny one yeah i mean i know that there's some lines in the film could potentially get a laugh but you don't realize until you start screening it with an audience mm. and each screening is different as well mm. i've shown this film we've played it all around the world and so i remember uh, in, in San Sebastian, there was a lot of laughs, whereas in other places, people were very serious about it and didn't laugh at all. Um, yeah. 
So it depends. But, you know, I'm aware of the fact that there is humour in there, just naturally within the witnesses. Well, because it's the, so bonkers. Yeah, yeah, some of the crazy stuff they say. Yeah. <laughs> outsiders, they don't know what else to do other than laugh at it, because otherwise it's pretty disturbing. I mean, if, if uh, JW called at their door and said some of this stuff to their face, they, they wouldn't be able to help themselves, would they? Yeah. And they're so taken in by the performances, it's like that's happening to yeah. them, in a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and some of the stuff that they do is quite cringeworthy. And uh, again, you don't know what's the, the reaction other than to laugh nervously mm. at some of that stuff. Yeah. So I don't know what kind... I mean, you were in the... I wasn't there last night, but it's... You know, I don't... People laugh for different reasons, don't they? It's not always just because it's a, a joke. No. So. No, sometimes it's a... It's like cringeworthy humour, isn't yeah. it? A lot of it. It's a genuinely cringeworthy spectacle for those like us who were in it. And, yeah. and part of it is wow, I can't believe I was part of that for so long. And part of it is, I can't believe I was saying things like that once, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, so one question that you were asked last night, um, which I thought was kind of obvious, but at the same time has a lot of nuance to it. What motivated you to make this film? I was... Um, I've had this in the back of my mind for a while, but I never felt comfortable telling the story or talking to people about it um you know it's the that fear that guilt was there for a while and then um i let it slip one day to a producer and they said all oh, right you're a job as witness we should um think about applying to a, a funding scheme to get this story told so i was sort of roped into it really really yeah and it was during the pro development of the script that I was just sort of getting more confident about exposing certain aspects of the religion. Um, I was sort of beating around the bush for ages as well and I had a false start with the script and, and then I also had the trouble of, of really trying to get into the mindset of the witnesses on the screen. Um, so it took a while. And then as I was developing it, I realised it's not just a secular audience. There's the thousands of people who have been disfellowshipped and I wanted to respect their story and um, and shed some light on these issues. And then also I wanted to make sure it was truthful enough that it wouldn't put witnesses off. Because mm. part of what I hope with the film is that witnesses, the curious ones, might come along and watch it and it might trigger something inside them. And we all know that when they JW or an XJW is watching, they're waiting for the thing that's wrong. Yeah. I mean, there will be that, and yeah, uh, there's nothing you can do about that. I it's just kind hope, of a I hope it hits them hard enough, though. That was yeah. the point, you know, it make it emotional enough, uh, uh, powerful enough that they might ignore some of the, the details that they, they don't agree with or whatever. Mm. Um, and, and I think as well, you're dealing with a moving target because the organisation's moved on since. Mm you were even maybe starting filming it yeah so it's it's hard to depict it as it is right now you yeah know, so but i think you did really well um you mentioned that there were people kind of spurring you on to make the film um my wife was watching oh no well, she didn't watch it she had not watched it yet but i was describing it to her last night when i got back and one of her questions was um how did you convince non-Jehovah's Witnesses to not just um, participate in the project, say, as, as actors, but also how did you enlist the support of, um, like, the British film industry, BBC films, mm. uh, where it's not obvious that they would want to become embroiled in a film about a religion that could potentially be criticising a religion. Yeah. I think it's the way we pitched it to them. Yeah. We said it was going to be a very even-handed film. It was going to look at both sides. We're going to explore the reasons why faith still exists today. Mm. So on a bro in a broader sense, that's what interested the BBC and the BFI. Yeah. Um, and also because of my connection with the story. Yeah. And the previous short films that I made, um, they felt comfortable that I was the, the one to do it. Right. Um, but it was also a scheme, it's, an eye it's called Eye Features and it's a scheme for first time filmmakers. So there's a lot of support there and they are looking for diverse and, and 
different ideas, stories about the regions, mm. about communities we don't know much about. Mm. So there was support there from the beginning. Right. Um, and there continues to be, and the, the sort of legal support as well, to make sure we're not getting into any trouble. Um, so that's continued all the way through the process. And how did you create... How did, this is one of the most amazing parts of the film for me, is that when you're watching it, it is like watching actual JWs. How do you take non-JW actors and basically coach them in how to be JWs? Hmm. It was, I mean, luckily enough, we had like about a week's rehearsal time before the film, before we started shooting. And a lot of that was just sitting down and telling them, you know, what it's like to be a witness. And the actors would read a line and just go, why, why would anyone do this? Why would anyone ever say something mm. like this? And, it, you know, it was always just discussing what's going on, what they're feeling, but what they're being told to do. Um, and, the t you know, the conflict there. And I think eventually they that started to understand that that kind of pressure, that the constant you know cognitive pressure that the witnesses are under, mm. versus what they're feeling as a mother or as a sister, um, it was a constant reminder. And it's hard to to get that across to some people, outsiders. And um, it you know I would show the actors a lot of the the Watchtower videos and show them some of the magazines. And I think eventually they started to get it. But there's always that tendency or that um, desire to, to maybe make fun of it mm. or to undermine the witnesses. And that was something we always had to check. Even, you know, I'm, I was guilty of it as well on mm. set. You might want a, a shot to linger a little longer on an elder's face just to like create a bit of humour. Mm. Um, but I was like, no, no, let's, you know, let's just try and tell this as, as truthfully mm. as possible. Mm. Um. Now, you mentioned earlier about legal issues. Yeah. Uh, when I was watching, I don't want to spoil the film too much, um, but I noticed there were some very clever devices used to get around the whole copyright issue. Mm. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Um, we, there were certain things we could do. Yeah. Um, I, I was surprised to find out that we were able to actually use some of the, the talks All right. verbatim. Oh, brilliant. If we reference the watchtower in the credits. Oh, good. So the, <laughs> that, that talk that Stephen gives at the end, the public needs right. talk about this fellowshipping, wow. that is based on a, a talk Fantastic. from a convention. And the, 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 even the, the, uh, the brother, the elder, gets um, a shout out in, in the credits. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that, you know. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I was finding a lot of... Um, recordings and things and I was working out if you know if I just changed certain words mm. I could get away with it um, so there was a lot of that going on mm. like, I'd say can I get away with this am I able to say this am I able to use this word and uh, the lawyers would just say yes and no to me um, but you like we, we weren't able to use the watchtower sy yeah. symbol yeah which is a bit of a shame because I don't know if you remember that kingdom hall in Oldham yeah. that was one of the old style of uh, Kingdom Halls where they actually had the, um, what do you call it, the, the, the watchtower. Yeah, the watchtower lo like logo with the yeah, turrets and they had that yeah. built onto the side of the right. wall, a huge one. Um, and I don't know if that was just a thing that happened at that Kingdom Hall, because I knew, I heard that El um, the go governing body didn't approve of that. So they had There to was a letter it. about it saying that if it's like part of the structure, in other words, it's in the brickwork, mm. then you don't have to worry about it. Right. If it can be removed, you should remove it. Right, yeah. okay. So yeah. they just removed the top bit of it, so that's why there's just like a square <laughs> bo block there now. <laughs> it's the random block on the <laughs> yeah, wall. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, uh, but I wanted to put it back on the wall. I was like, no, let's put that yeah. back, the watchtower symbol back on. Yeah. And uh, I even wanted, you know, the org, um, the blue plaque that yeah. we have, but, um, I, you know, obviously I wasn't allowed to do that. But you did use, very cleverly, I thought, you did have literature in there. Yeah. How, what, was that a, a nightmare to sort out? Yeah, uh, we just had to change the words and various things. I can't remember what we ended up calling the Watchtower magazine. I think it just had, had Buzz Blank on the top or something. One of them was. Theocratic News, I think <laughs> one of them was called. <laughs> So there's just slight variations yeah. of terms that we're familiar with. 
but they look this you know you can't from a distance you can't oh, tell. absolutely and, and actually the fact that you're having to kind of walk on eggshells so much says a lot about the nature of yeah. the organization you're talking about so yeah. um i want you to just briefly explain how you managed to use an actual kingdom hall again a kingdom hall i can remember working on yeah. how did you get to use it well at first i didn't think there was going to be any chance in hell yeah. but then we my location manager was looking into it and he said oh you know the witnesses are they're, they're selling off a few kingdom halls i was like all right okay downsizing and he found that one in oldham and then they just sold it off um and the new owners were in the middle of turning it into a cafe so was, when we got there, it had Kingdom Cafe on the wall. <laughs> Kingdom Cafe. Oh, good grief. But it was a little unfortunate. Enjoy a slice of melon with your muffin. <laughs> yeah, but, oh, good grief. Oh, but it, was a, it was a little unfortunate because they just ripped out all the interior. Mm. And that Kingdom Hall, they'd not, uh, they'd not touched it since, since whatever the 60s. So mm. the interior was great, but they just pulled it all out. Um, but I was so taken with the exterior. Mm. You know, the shot of the the hall sitting on top of that dual carriage. And you've got the, the noise of the traffic in the background. Yeah, and you've got, like, just life zooming past. Yeah. You know, life's on the move. Yeah. But here the witnesses are sort of standing still and waiting for something. So, in a way, the, the decline of the organisation, in a way, has contributed towards the success of your film. Because that's <laughs> one of the most compelling things, is that it's an actual kingdom hall. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um... We tried, We got in touch with it because there was another hall down the road that's empty but they've not managed to sell yet. So we got in touch and said, oh, would we be able to use your furniture and your chairs? And uh, we tried to meet up with one of the brothers there. And um, But we were like two minutes late, so we decided that he didn't like that and he left. And, uh, mm. But then he found out what the film was about, so then there was no chance. And it was Jehovah's Hand in matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um... Can you just talk a little bit about the two three aspect ratio? Because three two, sorry, three two. Uh, um, it w what led to you deciding on that? It worked brilliantly, but what led to you? Because you know, for viewers who don't understand, usually the aspect ratio that you're seeing now is more widescreen, but you used a far more narrowed mm -hmm. shot that's more akin to what you would expect on an old television, yeah. maybe. So what what led to that decision? We were, me and the cinematographer, Adam, we were looking at a lot of photographs and paintings as references. Mm. Um, there were a couple of artists in particular, Michael Burrowmans and uh, Daniel Coves, and they did a series of um, very like austere, uh, formal paintings of, of re religious women. And they were very stripped down and um, uh, simple colour palettes. Mm. And I was quite taken with, there's something about the minimalism of that that was quite powerful for me. And mm. it made me think back to being a witness. Mm. Um, so then as we were doing test shoots and um, filming rehearsals and things, we, um, we were like, we couldn't capture that feeling. It was too wide. It was like too cinematic. Yeah. It? And because of that, it felt too uh, uh, fictional. And yeah. So I said, All right, let's just try and shoot it in a 3-2, which is a stills photography aspect ratio. Yeah. And uh, straight away it was like, wow, yeah, this is about, it's suddenly become about their faces and about their internal journeys. I was going to say, because with the cinematic aspects, you're kind of more looking at what's going on in the background. Mm. But with yours, you're literally focused on the person. Yeah, yeah. So it worked really well. Yeah. And of course, it, it represents the witnesses and their mindsets and mm. the fact that they're in the world, but no part of it. Yeah. Know? That they they have a kind of blinkered look. They're focused on the new system and all this stuff around them. They're not that concerned about. Yeah. So that you know, by doing that slightly, you were less interested in what was going on. Exactly. No, it worked really well. So I also want to ask you about the device of prayer to express belief because. I think if I was going to write down a list of challenges in making a film about Jehovah's Witnesses, it's how do you convey what they're thinking? Mm. So how much of a challenge was it to incorporate that into the film? It was difficult, yeah. yeah. To begin with, uh, I um, just didn't know how to do it, go about it. It was so sort of complex, the psychology of the Witnesses, that um, there was something missing. It was like, I just wish I was... Um, 
sort of writing a book about it really mm. than trying to put it on screen. Mm. So at some point I decided, let's just try and write, start from Alex's point of view and just, she's talking to God about her day. Mm. And with that, she's able then to articulate how she feels about certain things, but in that kind of religious context and the idea that she's worried about how God is going to uh, respond to what she's saying. Mm. So I did that. The whole story was a prayer at one point. Um, and then slowly and surely I started to adapt that into a script. And I thought it was quite nice because that's one of the things I remember about being, that was appealing about the witnesses is the, the way they treated prayer or the personal mm. part of prayer, how you, um, you were encouraged to um, articulate your own thoughts. Rather than just repeat the yeah. same mantra. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, worked, that worked really well and I thought really did the job of, well, this is, they're, they're doing this because this is what they really think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was nice because at, <clears throat> at the beginning of the film, you're just right in there then. Aren't you? You're in Alex's head mm. and you understand the, that sort of constant pressure she's under. And in a weird way, way it sort of felt like an opening prayer to the film. Yeah. Because it's a prayer and then she sort of says in Jesus' name and then like the rest of the film. And in the, in the open, I counted, I think, three things in the opening five or ten minutes that you'd batted out. Mm. So you'd, um, excuse the train, so you'd, you'd have them handled blood, birthdays, and I think a third thing, which I can't quite remember, just in the opening five or ten minutes, which brilliantly kind of, again, shows, no, we're dealing with different people here. Yeah, you know? yeah. We're really well. Now, um, on a scale of one to ten, one being very disappointed and 10 being expectations exceeded how how do you what how would you rate the response to the film just generally speaking yeah it's been overwhelming yeah yeah nine or ten i'd say yeah yeah, yeah. um for various reasons i mean the, we premiered at toronto which is a big festival and since then we've shown it all around the world um and people are just, you know, we, we, secular people, they mm. just can't believe that this stuff goes on yeah. within the witnesses. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they just, they understand what the, by the end of it, they understand the pressure that these people are under. Yeah. And, uh, and they thank me for it. And, um, but then also there are lots of ex-witnesses are turning up and uh, they feel it's a cathartic thing to see this on screen. Um, so I've just, you know, when I was making the film, I was unsure about why I was doing it or how people were going to react. But now it's out there and, and people are sort of sending me messages and things. It's like, right, it feels like it was a reason for, for making the film. And you got an award. <laughs> Daniel's been really shy about... He said, no, don't have it in the background. I was like, no, you're having it in the background. Oh, okay. So can you just, for all of the XJWs watching, this is like, come on. <laughs> Camera close we, we, yeah, okay. They were, we were selected at London Film Festival. Yeah. So, and then we ended up winning the IWC Bursary Award, which is kind of like their best film for British debut yeah. feature film. Um, yeah, well, that's the award. Hold on. <laughs> Not going to do it. It came with a nice bursary as well, which... There you go. Oh my God, this is <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I've got a few others in there. There's a lot of XJWs who are proud <laughs> about this, you know. Um, how important was it for you to show the humanity of JWs? I think that's one thing you did. You, hmm. you showed the conflict and you showed moments of levity as well as moments of... Um, angst and being yeah. sombre and that kind of thing. I think that's that was a way to get outsiders interested first and foremost that um, it couldn't just be polemic. People were not going to be interested in that. They wanted mm. to see sort of two sides to the coin, mm. like why faith exists, the positives mm. of some aspects of the community. Mm. But then really, ultimately at the end it's about disfellowshipping and excommunication. Yeah. So um, I had to get that balance, just, to, you know, the tonal balance as well. I like sort of undercutting serious things with a bit of humour and vice versa. Yeah. Keeps people sort of engaged. And it's a pal 
palatable way to deal with the subject. Because there's a moment where there's like quote unquote worldly music and it's very arresting from what you've already been. But the mm -hmm. truth is that there are JWs who, and especially in the community that we grew up in, there were, there were wild parties and, and weddings that maybe got a little bit out of hand, you know. Yeah. So I like that that was yeah. captured in the film. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, was it easy to show restraint in in making sure that your experience with the JWs didn't impact on the film in terms of conveying any kind of bitterness or or mockery or that kind of yeah. thing? Yeah, like I said earlier, there's a, there's that's a temptation all mm. the time. Um, there's something uncomfortable about becoming a witness for the actors and for myself as the director. You had to respect it and treat it truthfully. And with that, then you had to sort of let yourself go a little bit and transform mm. yourself. And it's, it is uncomfortable, that stuff. Um, and you come away sort of feeling morally unsure about what's just happened um but uh, we just we kept at it because it was important not to undermine the characters and uh, be as truthful as possible because that then maybe certain people watch the film mm. and not feel sort of offended by it mm. yeah it certainly wasn't a book of mormon it was yeah. uh, treating it seriously yeah, yeah yeah and um i think I mentioned, uh, I think I've, I've asked that question already. Um, you mentioned briefly your JW background. Uh, I just want to ask, has your family seen the film? No. No? No, as far as I'm aware of, no. no. I know my mum, she probably, she might watch it, but at the moment she's um, she's no. not interested. It's too close to the bone. And it has to be her decision, doesn't it? Yeah. I think. And you mentioned last night something about elders having seen it. What's that about? I heard that. I mean, it was on the it was on ITV Granada. There was a big right. piece on the film, and uh, the journalist then at the end said they'd been in touch with the Watchtower to get their opinion on the film. But obviously, they didn't say yeah. either way. But then I heard because of that that they sent two elders out to review the film in Manchester at the Manchester. The Watchtower sent two elders. Yeah, well, that's what. I've, yeah, that's wow. what I heard. Um, so they're formulating opinion. They must have an opinion. But there's a significance to two elders because then you've got two witnesses. Yeah. Does that? Have <laughs> okay, yeah. that have you thought of that? No. <laughs> two witness rule. Yeah. <laughs> so I, don't I wish it was there to, though to see them debating the film. You yeah. know, that'd be great. You yeah. could just get a fly on the wall in there. I can imagine them sat there with the new world translation and the notebook and yeah. the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's or in the audience, sort of checking the reference, the scriptural yeah, references. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's crazy. Um, last two questions. Um, what are your hopes for any Jehovah's Witnesses who watch the film? Um, I hope that they'll um, give it time, you know, if uh, and see that I, I try to be as truthful as possible with this story, and that maybe in some way, if they they can see some of what they're doing on screen and it's articulated in a certain way and because of that they've got that distance and there's a bit more objectivity about their out, you know their view you might start to question some of these activities just simple things you know like the scene when Ivana's eating in the kitchen and, oh, and yeah. Louise's you know yeah. she just breaks down while she's eating you know, I know so many people who have done that sort of thing. Wow. And maybe if they just yeah. see it on the screen like that, it might trigger something, you know, yeah. a positive thing. I mean, that's my hope. I really hope so. Yeah. And final question. Um, I'm interested to hear what you have to say to this. Can you, can you expect or can you imagine doing any more JW work or are you done with it now? I've... Um, there's, uh, we're only scratching the surface, mm. you know. We're dealing with excommunication and yeah. a blood issue, but there's so much juicy material within the witnesses, so I've not quite finished with them. Mm. Um, but I'm not sure if it's a fictional film. It might be documentary or right. other, other projects. Right. But, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I'm trying to tell stories. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to sort of pigeonhole myself too much, but... It's there. Yeah. And in a weird way, it's always there. You know, it's part of who we are. We grew up as witnesses. And um, 
it affects all the source, all my projects and all the work in some maybe abstract way. Fantastic. I'm really pleased to hear that. Yeah. So how can people watch Apostasy? Well, Apostasy is out in cinemas this weekend, Friday 27th of July. So it'll be on at your local indie cinema all around the UK. Um, and then shortly after, it'll be on DVD and Blu-ray and Amazon and iTunes. So you can purchase it there. And then at some point next year, it'll be on the BBC. Brilliant. Daniel, hey, it's been a pleasure, pleasure, Lloyd. I really Thank appreciate you. it. And again, if you haven't already seen Apostasy, please see it. It's very worthwhile, so please check it out. If you want to see more interviews like this one, please don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel. But for now, I hope you've enjoyed this video. And as always, thank you for watching.